You're listening to the Casting Shadows Podcast. This is RPG A Day 2022. This RPG A Day 2022 episode of the Casting Shadows Podcast is a combination episode, like the one which came before it, and the one which came before that. It's looking at the prompts, or the questions, which spanned day 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. So those are the week three questions, which are now behind us. On the written blog, we have been going through day by day. There's been a post released every day. And on YouTube, we've been doing things in advance. So we're answering the questions in advance of the week. So there, we're looking at the responses to week four. Here, we're looking back at the responses to week three. And on the written blog, we're going through day by day. Now, sometimes the content is completely different. And sometimes the focus on specific details is different. And sometimes it's a surprise. Also this week for the podcast, we've released a bonus episode. Maybe you've already heard it. I released it yesterday, or maybe it's one that you're saving. It was specifically targeted for people who were worried that they might not have responses for this week's line of question from the 22nd through the 27th about characters. Well, maybe, hopefully, that bonus episode will serve as a guide or a blueprint or a source of inspiration, because after all, these are prompts. Even though they're in the form of questions, they're there to inspire and help talk about role-playing games in a positive way. They're not a box that your response must fit in. Although, for some people, that's fun too. Anyway, let's get into this episode. We're going to begin with some calls. We have a lot of calls because a week has passed between the last major recording. And so, we're going to hear from Joe from Hindsightless. We're going to hear from Jason from Nerds RPG Variety Cast. And we're going to hear from BJ Boyd from the arcane alienist, or maybe more by the time I get this assembled. But for now, let's begin with a call from Jason. Hey, Anthony Jason here. Darn you, I don't need to buy any more games, but Caporia sounds pretty cool, so I just might give in. We'll see. Anyhow, really enjoyed your RPG a day, week three, and looking forward to the next one. Take care. Huh, I said week three. I guess yours is actually week two, so sorry about that. This message is being sent from the web browser on my phone, where the previous message was sent through the Anchor app. I'm curious on your thoughts on the audio quality difference. Well, there are two very important details present in those calls. First, that at the time of recording, Jason was considering buying Corporea, but I have it on good authority from Jason himself that Jason has purchased Corporea. And that's cool. It's nice when a suggestion gets acted upon. Now, on my part, I have proposed out there, for people that I know, that I'll be doing something about running Corporea in September. And right now I have two people who have taken me up on that very vague, non-pitched invitation that the game will be run, that's as far as much as we've said. And there may be one, maybe two more seats available. If that sounds interesting to you, maybe let me know. The second important detail was about audio quality in the calls. 
based on the different ways we have to do it. Of course, the app being the easiest and most reliable, but we're expecting not to be able to do that for very much longer. We've been experimenting, calling in from the desktop and calling in through the browser on our phone. The calls presented by Jason no problem at all. They sound exactly the same. In my own experience, I've had quite a divergence in audio quality from very, very bad, distorted, and low volume audio to good audio, but with pops and missing words, or with words that are caught in some kind of, you know, like rap music like repetition for moments. So, generally speaking, it seems like we can rely on the audio quality, but we may experience drops in quality that we don't appreciate, along with not appreciating the disappearance of the Discovery tab and its associated Favorites link. So, how has everyone else's experience been with this investigation? Inquiring minds want to know. Now, let's hear some more calls from Jason in response to some other ideas. But before we do that, let's actually take a swing over in the direction of some responses from Joe of Hindsightless, who has some things in common with what Jason's going to talk about, but has his own things to say as well, and his unstoppably positive way of saying them, which is so perfectly in tune with this entire event. What do you got to say, Joe? Yo, Anthony, loving the RPG a day stuff. I'm I'm deep in the middle of it. It's awesome. Thanks again for helping to get all this stuff going, man. You and your buddy are awesome. Uh, it, it's it's really interesting, right, to think of the ways, the different ways, and people look at the same questions. Uh, you talked about how with what was the second RPG you bought, a lot of people talked about what was the second RPG a day thing or RPG they played. Uh, and for me, when I was thinking about what what world would we want to live in, I wasn't thinking about taking myself now, transporting it into that world. I was thinking about growing up in that world. So like for you, you mentioned the far future. If you were living in that far future setting, if you grew up there, you would probably, because you seem like a super smart dude, have the requisite skills to be a contributing member of society. So yeah, it's just fascinating, man. I love it. Peace out. Well, thanks for the kind words, Joe. And yeah, the variation in how people take the questions or the prompts or whichever, the variation in the responses is one of the things which keep David and I going year after year with this event. It's not just talking positively. It's not just hearing about all kinds of different RPGs that fill the same criteria. It's the the really juicy and interesting differences in how people read the question from the outset and what their initial take on it is and then what they ultimately do with the question. And that whole process, sometimes you know, people share their whole process about how they answer, is, is truly fascinating. Anyway, Jason kind of links in with what you were talking about, about, well, you know, if we were born in the future, we might be able to fit right in. But he also has another idea. There's variation in the connection. Hey, Anthony, here's another audio response to a YouTube video. You talked about how you weren't sure what you could contribute to a future, a science fiction future, if you went to it in, you know, what setting would you like to live in or something like that. And I would offer to you that many people contributed in fiction to science fiction worlds. Now, if we're going to hold it to science fiction worlds, we're going to eliminate movies like Iceman, Encino Man, 
TV shows like Life on Mars, and characters like Captain America and Austin Powers. But that still leaves us quite a few excellent examples, as I will talk about in my next call. So what are some good examples? Well, of course, Buck Rogers is a stereotypical example, although if we talk about the TV show, I only have vague memories, and I don't really remember what Gil Gerard himself brought to the 25th century as a special skill set. Both Khan and Scotty appeared in the future in the Star Trek universe, Scotty in Next Generation. Joe in Idiocracy. Come on, that's maybe a world our, we're, we're on the trajectory towards. I hope not. George Taylor in Planet of the Apes. Stephen Fry in Futurama. John Spartan in Depth Militia Man. Jason Voorhees and Jason X. Okay, there are probably more positive examples in these last few. <laughs> but I, 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 do, I don't think you should sell yourself short. I, I think somebody at a time can probably always bring perspective and interest to, to the future. I moved in December and I packed everything. And now I can't find my goalie mask. <laughs> now, those suggestions are pretty interesting. And, you know, again, thanks for the kind words. Um, you know, true story. I have the Buck Rogers, the Gil Gerard Buck Rogers from the 80s on, on DVD. And at one point I had a desire to watch it. And I was kind of surprised because my wife wanted to watch it with me. And of course she'd not seen it and knew nothing about it in any you know aspect of the character. And she said, if you liked it as a kid, you know, sure, I'll watch it. And this is a very rare experience. She likes to watch new things. She doesn't like to watch old things. And I have a devil of a time getting her to watch anything that's in black and white, let me tell you. But this was in color. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the the player can upscale so it doesn't it doesn't appear with as a square. So she was willing to give it a chance. And of course, that first episode has... Gil Gerard and the princess disco dancing in spandex and glitter and everything. And I've got it in the back of my mind that somewhere during this episode, this is going to happen. And I guess that will be the end of watching Buck Rogers with my wife. But she did stick with it for quite a few episodes before we moved on to something else. And so I was, I was quite surpre- uh, surprised and pleased by that. But, uh, we did have a talk about um, if that may have been a contributing factor to why, as a young man, I really didn't like disco. And it was hard to deny it may have played a role and you know, driving me into the loving arms of heavy metal. As Jason mentioned when he began this series of calls, this was in response to my YouTube release from last week, which is the week three questions, which are the ones that are going to be featured similarly and differently here in today's podcast. So I think it's good to have them all here and all together in this call section. Now we get into some pretty heavy stuff, and I think that's good. Positivity doesn't mean turning a blind eye to the darkness that's out there. So let's get into it. Although I tend to separate the artist from the art, these days I, it, it really depends. So, like I remember as a child and really liking Sleeper, Woody Allen's movie, but I have not revisited it as an adult, and I really hesitate to revisit Sleeper as an adult. I, I don't know if I ever will. Um, like, I guess another example would be, well, if we go to literature, and, instead of doing a negative examples... In literature, you have things like the, you know, is it the Forever War, where you know the characters con- constantly, because of the way the space travel works, end up, you know, in the future each time, and each time bringing insight from the past with them. And the last one that I've omitted here, and it pains me to do it because I'm a Heinlein fan, is of course um, Farnham's Freehold. Although you know Charlie Strauss, who's one of us you know, the author of The Laundry Files, he actually wrote a defense, a lukewarm defense of Heinlein. I'll I'll send you a link to it, uh, where he talks about for Farnham's freehold, Heinlein was given 
the plot's already written down, given the story by John W. Campbell, who was a famous racist, and Heinlein watered it down. And this was during the the era of civil rights and, you know, Martin Luther King and all, Martin Luther King Jr. And I think Heinlein was trying to spin Farnham's Freehold to tell a story, but and, and race swapping it, you, you know, doing a typical sci-fi twist, but he just it just fell on its face, and the book has not aged well at all, sadly. Well, you've brought up some absolutely fantastic examples, both you know pleasant memories and and things to be avoided for you know various reasons about this whole notion of you know the person out of time. Uh, the Forever War by Haldeman. Uh, it's a, it's amazing how subtly influential that winds up being in our circles. You know, its influence over BattleTech, and just on the the science fiction that informs things like Traveler and and whatnot. It's just it's it's really out there, and I think it's a very valuable read. Although there are some aspects of it which might make modern readers quite uncomfortable. There are still questions that it raises. And uh, similarly, uh, John Stakely's armor, uh, while not exactly having that man-out-of-time feel, there's a, a similar displacement um, in, the, in the character's ability to relate to those around them and the out-of-sync... Uh, you know, relation of the story, uh, you know, plays that role as well. I think I kind of got lucky in regard to to Woody Allen and the problems created by Woody Allen being Woody Allen by just having a negative reaction to Woody Allen from the beginning. And so I had nothing to lose <laughs> and didn't have to make that choice of separating the artist from the art. He's, he's not one of my beloved directors. Um, I've just, I've kind of dodged that bullet through, through time. But the one that keeps, you know, hitting me, of course, is, is Lovecraft. How can you appreciate Lovecraft's writing so much when he was such a despicable human? And these days I find myself wondering, you know, after having read his letters and after having read, uh, accounts of his life, it, it makes me wonder, like, under what sort of mental burdens he was laboring and whether or not he would be diagnosed with something and, and be on some sort of, you know, therapy and management program to deal with things of which his racism may have been a symptom. Uh, and the fact that he mellowed in later life is often uh, ignored. So it's, it's just awkward. We don't have to accept the terrible things that he said and wrote. And, you know, we don't have to accept the way that uh, his friends were shocked you know, <laughs> by the you know extremeness of his racism, but at the same time, there has to be a way to look at people without absolutely categorizing them as a thing, reviling them as the thing and casting them out because they're a thing because that's not fundamentally different from the racism that we are attacking. You know, what is it? Hate the sin, but love the sinner. There has to be a way for us to look at Lovecraft as a victim crying for help, I think. And Somehow I think we sell ourselves short if we can't see the desperate situation he was in. We ignore all the signs, but it's difficult to progress with this line of thought while also sticking to the very firm line that what he actively proposed and suggested and portrayed through most of his life is not acceptable. You know, it's, it's, it's thorny and difficult, especially when we are removed from the source in time. And it's just easier to just say, ah, screw that guy.
All right. This last set of calls comes from BJ Boyd, the arcane alienist, and final one from Jason. And they are in response to the bonus episode, which I mentioned at the top of the show, which is the week four questions, but from the Forever Game Master's point of view. All right. After that, we'll get right into the topics. Hey, Anthony, it's BJ. I just want to let you know I am listening to your episodes. I don't have any specific feedback, um, but I people are calling in on my shows, and I'm, I'm a several days to a week behind on, on keeping up, so I don't, I don't have specific feedback, but I thought I'd at least ought to return the courtesy and let everybody know that I'm listening to their shows as well and, and enjoying the, uh, the uh, hearing what everybody's talking about with each prompt. So uh, thanks again for your episodes and for putting this whole thing together. Hey, Jason here. Great episode on RPG A Day Week for encouraging people to talk about their NPCs for the forever GMs out there. Thought it was very encouraging and it's very, very enticing to want to watch your actual play if only I had the time. But at the moment, I don't. Wish I did. Hopefully, someday, I'll get that chance. Until then, uh, I'll just have to let thoughts about it dance in my head. It is the vivid characters you described are, are there waiting in the wings for me to watch at some point. Take care. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, gentlemen, and for the votes of support. It's always nice to be able to put a voice to the notion of a listener. Something that a comment on YouTube or you know a like or whatever on whatever platform just fails to deliver on. You know that they're out there. You, you know that the message has been in some way heard, but you're not sure how. And so that's one of the things that makes Anchor special and makes the Anchor Apocalypse so disappointing. Anyway, thanks for calling in. Let's get down to the main event. Week three of RPG A Day 2022 is behind us. On the podcast, I'm enjoying kind of looking back over the week that we've left behind to see how my thoughts from before the week started may have changed or in some way matured. <laughs> So we begin with question 15, which is, who would you like to Game Master for you? And what I selected for the YouTube video, uh, which was released last Sunday, was Walter B. Gibson, who was the person behind the house name Maxwell Grant, who wrote The Shadow. And he wrote The Shadow, not just the pulp novelizations, but he wrote a lot of the scripts. He was responsible for the creation and shaping of the character beyond the simple notion that the radio station already had of this shadowy narrator figure. Now, why would I pick him? And I'm still going to talk about him. I'm not going to change my call. Why would I want him to be a game master? Well, one, he had a second career as a stage magician. It's not one that dominated his life, but the practice of magic did. You can find it all throughout the hundreds of novelizations he did for The Shadow. All right. Many of the ways that The Shadow gets into places and out of places, the way that The Shadow controls the perception of the villains poised against him, all of these things and the, the different tricks and the ideas of miniaturization and nimbleness and accuracy and so many of the skills and abilities of the shadow can be traced back to Walter Gibson's understanding of stage magic. So as a performer and able to command, literally command, the attention and attentiveness of an audience, I think that would be an interesting experience to have as a game master. More than that, he began his writing career as a newspaper reporter. And so I find 
that connectedness to the events of the day and that understanding of what does and does not see print and what is and is not considered news, all of these things, I think, can add a dimension to game mastering, which I find really satisfying. And then being able to handle the tremendous pressures of the pulp industry, not to mention to thrive and be at the top for so very long. All of these suggest that his ability to think on his feet, to adapt to, to pressure, to be able to break through barriers and roadblocks and problems which might stymie other writers, all of these things set him up for the type of game mastering that I really enjoy, which is improvisation, which has been thoroughly prepared for, preparation for improvisation, where we don't think about story, we're not really considering story, what we're considering is what is the situation, what is the inciting situation, what are the actual characters involved, who are they as people, what are their motivations, what are their abilities to achieve those motivations, and now let's smash them together in the crucible of actual play and enjoy that experience. And at the end, if there is an end, we'll have stories to tell. I think that Gibson would have been amazing as a game master. And so he is my pick for question 15. Question 16, our what question, what would be your perfect game? In my YouTube response, I talked about the structures of the perfect game. My interpretation of the question is just one of the possible interpretations of the question, interpreted game as the act of playing. So I didn't pick a particular title, and I didn't pick a particular day or a particular group of people. Instead, I chose a way of playing. What would be your perfect game if we did the following thing? So I described that process on YouTube. So here, I'm going to give an example. Before I left for Korea, and I left for Korea in 1997, we had been running a lot of World of Darkness games, and there was one core World of Darkness game, which I had been running uh, since 91. So it ran through 91 through near the end of 97 when I left. And there were many chronicles, as they're called in the World of Darkness, which grew out of this one for each of the game lines, and then splinters from those separate game lines to look at mortals interfering with that particular type of supernaturals. And for those who are not familiar, the original World of Darkness had five. It started with Vampire the Masquerade, went into Werewolf the Apocalypse, then Mage the Ascension, and then Wraith the Oblivion, and then finally Changeling the Dreaming. And so there are multiple ways that you could approach these things, and I was kind of in a mood to approach all of them. We had a lot of time to play, and we had a lot of players, and so we had different groups that we could draw upon and mix and match. We had pretty much everybody in the group was interested in running the games as well as playing the games. We had spin-off chronicles that went off with different game masters. We had whole groups that split off and came back. It was a really exciting time, and it's this kind of... Same world, same setting, same timeline, same characters, shared history, but different game masters and different players interacting with it that I find particularly exciting. And one of the ways that we dealt with this near the end of that run was to start a certain spin-off chronicle in the Dark Ages, you know, in the 12th century, and then have a second game master look at the rise of the Sabbat, right? The, the really evil vampires. <laughs> and have another game master looking at the, you know, the 70s and 80s. And then a final game master looking at modern day. We're tracking characters who may or may not survive through all of these oceans of time. And you know, we had a contingency plan for if a character died in the past but had been played in the present. Well, they were an imposter, weren't we? You know, we've read comics. We know how that works. 
And it was just a lot of fun. We've done this idea many, many times down through, you know, down through the years with different games and different environments. You know, you, you can do it very easily with Call of, Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu because they have the eras laid out and very distinctly defined for you. So it makes the research part easy. It makes the, the dividing lines in time very easy to organize and get your different game masters in action and switch between and even talk about, you know, tonight we're going to play Gaslight and tomorrow we're going to play Cthulhu Now and, you know, that kind of stuff. We did it with the Trinity line from the World of Darkness. So Adventure and Aberrant and what was supposed to be called Aeon but had to be renamed as Trinity because greed. <laughs> And, you know, just there's a variety of games that you can do this with. Battletech uh, being another example that we, we played on. So this example of these shared worlds with shared and overlapping areas of responsibility and separate areas of responsibility where we play troop style, we play characters in the past, we play characters in the quote-unquote present, we play characters in the future, we play their relatives and their offspring and, and their friends and... And we can explore many different types of situation and many different types of character and have really involved problems to wrestle with and decisions to make. And I find that is my perfect gaming environment. And it's much less work than it sounds like. <laughs> The calls earlier in the episode from Joe and Jason about the future, about being a man out of time, and whether or not you'd have anything to contribute to a future world as yourself, or in what context it might make more sense to imagine uh, arriving in a future world or living in a future world. My answer has been the past. I would be drawn to the past. If I were to go as myself, then I'd want a place for my current skill, my current ability, my current health. Uh, all of those things would allow me to feel useful in a, in a full-on way, right? To bring everything I have to bear to deal with everything that, with which those people are dealing. That's kind of the way that I took the question. If it were possible then yes, I would love to see and experience and live in the future. And it would be amazing to have something to contribute, even if it were only perspective, to that future. While at my age, I'm unlikely to be called up like Gil Gerard's Buck Rogers to be a fighter pilot. <laughs> that would be all right. Uh, but then again, they'd have to teach me how to be a pilot first. So that seems highly unlikely. But... Uh, if it's necessary to have swordsmen for hire in the future, I'm your guy. <laughs> but anyway, yes, the world of, of Star Trek would be an amazing one to be able to explore, um, where a lot of our higher ideals have become day-to-day -day truths. That sounds appealing, too. The question for day 18 is, where is your favorite place to play? And I truly love to be in a position to have the opportunity to host the game, to have all of my books around us, to have my tons of dice accessible to us, and all the different things that I've collected over the years to make playing the games more fun, faster, and easier. However... <laughs> It just hasn't been possible for a very long time, and that's totally cool. I'm totally fine with that. It's a decision that we made, and I accept. Now, living over here in Asia has always made it a little difficult because apartments are quite small, and travel times can be quite long, and schedules are quite bad. And uh, for a lot of my time here in the early days, um, before I had you know a stable group of people to play with, we were working normally six days a week and working, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week. So the idea of gathering together to play a game was hard for people. So uh, it was difficult to want to invite people who are probably going to stay strangers 
into my home to play. And so we would often go somewhere else to play. And that's when I got into the habit of of renting meeting spaces and using those, which have all the technology you could ever want and, and that sort of stuff. But what I've discovered since, especially living in Daejeon and you know, starting up a new group with some people who'd never played before and some people who hadn't played very often and some people who hadn't played for a long time and you know that kind of thing, and starting a new game with them and we're all scattered all over that city. We all had different schedules, but we could come together and we could meet in a coffee shop, which is really, really less than ideal. Very, very noisy. Lots of people coming in and out, everybody staring, like, why are there dice on the table? And, you know, why are all these foreign people, you know, yammering on in a foreign language in the middle of this coffee shop? But it didn't matter. Um, the game was exciting. The people had the capacity to focus. They were motivated. And it became... The perfect environment. So with that right group, wherever we are, uh, it reminded me that I used to play in stairwells. I used to, you know, ride out on my bicycle before I got a driver's license. You know, I used to ride out down the highway um, to play in an old fort. <laughs> So I have a history of playing in less than ideal conditions. And the thing that makes that lack of perfection irrelevant is that the games became immersive anyway. Our investment in them made them something we could do despite the situation. So while it would be great if we didn't have to ignore the situation, I've learned over time that the situation is one of the smaller problems. The biggest enemy is, of course, time. The why question for this week, and I just love that why falls on Fridays. The why question was, why has your favorite game stayed with you? And I give kind of a vague response in the YouTube video, I feel, uh, to go along with this. So I'll try and be a little bit more specific. The, I think first criterion for a game to to be one that I return to again and again is that people enjoyed it, right? I don't really want to try and convince a group of people that, you know, trust me, just stick with it a little bit longer, you're going to get it. I, I don't really have that in me. There's a, there's a limit. I'll start out that way to overcome the initial resistance to change or whatever, or to help people get past, you know, letting go of of one game that we've really enjoyed and sailing into the uncertain waters of a new game we have yet to try. But at a certain point, it's time to let it go. So a game which we really enjoy, that's the beginning. So the system aspect of the game has to be one that I feel like I really get, I feel comfortable with, and uh, I can hold in my mind. It does The level of crunch doesn't seem to matter uh, whether it's light or heavy, it's the underlying logic of it which matters to me. Do I really get why we're doing the things that we're doing? Do I agree with it? And can I see the underlying metaphors of play that these things, you know, what are these things an, an analog for? Does, does whatever we do for combat put me in mind of combat? Does it connect to my visual imagination and my remembered, you know, my kinesthetic memory of combat? If it can do these things, it's very likely to stay with me. Some things are very, very cerebral. Like I love the moral project, but it's not one of those games that uh, I suggest to a lot of people. I really like all the different information that can come out of it, but I will pitch it as a game for very specific people, and then we will we will enjoy that particular experience of play. So it has stayed with me down through the years, but it's very rarely on the table compared to Call of Cthulhu or compared to Star Wars or compared to some you know expression of of BRP or D100 or you know Mithras is my my current game for that. So that shared sense of enjoyment, my sense of 
understanding of how the system functions. Those are essentials. And the sense, finally, that it matters that it's me running it. If I don't feel like I'm actively contributing something to it, then I'm less likely to stick with it, if that makes any sense. So a lot of the games that I play have some kind of connection to The Legends of Arthur. Why is that relevant to me? Because, you know, that made up the bulk of my studies in university. A lot of the games that I play focus on a certain kind of melee violence. Why? Because most of my life here in Asia has been spent learning how to do those sorts of things. And so it's an expression of who I am and, and what I've learned and, and that kind of thing. So that personal connection, personal understanding, and personal enjoyment. This ultimately is why games stay in rotation. Even games that the internet claims are terrible. Somehow, we can find a way to play and enjoy them, suggesting that maybe these games might not be terrible, might not be evil, but might merely, as Captain Picard might suggest, be misunderstood. This is the saddest question of them all, day 20. How long do your games last? Looking back, the games were much, much longer. Now, it would be funny and fun to make a joke saying, well, you know, because I'm so much older now, I just can't play for that long. But that's not really it. In a face-to-face -face environment, in a comfortable location, we can play for a pretty long time. But it's always schedules which shorten the duration. But playing online, we have noticed that it's simply more fatiguing. There's something about the separation. There's something about way, the ways that the microphones and the headphones interact. There's something about being, in a sense, tied to your desk and needing to emote through the webcam to other people to convey you know, a, a fuller experience. Language alone just doesn't cut it. The body language and being able to see the body language and the facial expressions, these are a part of play. This is a serious part of play. And it's draining to look for those and try and broadcast those through this medium. Now, that is not to say that I disparage the medium. I am thriving because we can play this way through Hangouts originally and, and through Zoom these days. Without this... I don't know what I would do. So I greatly value it, but that experience has had to be reduced down to around a two-hour limit. Now, sometimes if we're really, really motivated and if we're all very comfortable with the amount of time that we have and we're all well-rested, then we'll push that to three. But just as often, some scheduling change or whatever will drag it down to... 90 minutes, or even an hour. So how long do your games last? Not long enough is the official answer. A face-to-face -face game, I have learned that I really like a four-hour block. I used to really like a six-hour block, but I rarely find the group size that I enjoy, like four or five players, I rarely find that all of them are able to go full-on for six hours. Four hours that's pretty much a surefire thing. So I like a four-hour game. But online, even if I have more time, two hours. Kind of weird. All right, the last prompt for this combined episode brings us squarely up to date with yesterday at time of recording. I'm recording this on Monday the 22nd. So the 21st Sunday was Setting Sunday, which asks us to share an intriguing detail from a game setting you enjoy. And the game that I picked was Blue Planet, probably my favorite science fiction game that I play because it's a science fiction game, that I play because the setting is amazing, that I play because the mechanisms, the system is so enjoyable. Mm, there's just so much great stuff to go with Blue Planet. And yet, on my shelf, it's probably the most cursed game. Now, I've gotten quite a few people to play Blue Planet with me. 
But I'm a campaign kind of person. I like campaign play. Every time I have set out to start a Blue Planet campaign, something has happened. Schedules have changed. People have changed jobs. People have left countries. People have been taken away from their opportunity to play Blue Planet. Nobody's been upset about the game. Nobody said, I don't want to play that. It hasn't been like that at all. That's all the other games on my shelf. You know, Blue Planet. We have been denied the opportunity to play a campaign. The Blue Planet curse is how I think about it. I got really close about two years ago. I haven't tried it since because we've been waiting for Blue Planet recontact. Maybe this revival of the game, this update to color and this update to you know the newer system options that you know the, the years in between its first inception and its first edition and now have brought about, you know, maybe this will help me break the curse. Or maybe it'll just be another reason to be sad. <laughs> but Blue Planet is, if nothing else, a frontier. And it is truly amazing and intriguing to me just how deep that frontier is made to be in Blue Planet. Characters have so many compelling motivations to want to go to the planet Poseidon, to give up the crumbling ruin of their life on a dying earth and make the transition through the wormhole to Poseidon. The things that are waiting for them there are horrific and horrifying, and yet the opportunities present on the frontier make it all worthwhile. It's difficult to explain just how strong the lore is, but the one intriguing detail that I wanted to pull out is called the Long John. It's this mysterious ore which seems to help us work better with DNA unlocking different secrets, enabling different manipulations. We've already grown quite skilled in this setting at doing specific things with DNA, but this enables so much more. And people understand that we're sitting on the threshold of widespread human longevity. And maybe more than that. Well, if you've made it this far, thank you very much for listening to another combined episode for RPG A Day 2022. I hope that there's been something for you to engage with, whether that was a point raised by a caller or a response from me or something in the response to the prompts. Hopefully there's something in here for you. Anyway, I'd like to thank those who did call in and those who have been interacting with me throughout the event so far. That's one of the things that makes it very special. And a special thanks goes out to fellow casualties of the Time War, Jason Connerly and BJ Boyd. I know how you feel, guys. There's so little time and so much to do. But anyway, until the next time, take care. You've been listening to the Casting Shadows podcast. If you'd like to hear more thoughts about role-playing games or read more thoughts about role-playing games, you can find those thoughts by me on castingshadowsblog.com, a WordPress blog, or on YouTube at youtube.com slash runeslinger. I'm also on Facebook. You can find me there at facebook.com slash runeslinger. Regardless, thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you'll listen to more episodes, and more than that, I hope you'll interact with me about role-playing games here or in the other places that we've just mentioned. <laughs>